Bob Surridge, um, uh, hosting today's uh, second Tuesday talk. And thanks everyone for for coming coming in and spending some time with us. Um, you probably know everyone probably knows today's speaker, but we're going to do a little little introduction uh, of the of the topic and of of Tommy Tommy Harrelson. You know the the book which Tommy wrote now a few a few years ago about Southport's Art Art Newton is just a a beautiful piece of piece of work. It is uh, Tommy did a fine a fine job both in the the narrative and the art that he that he chose for the for the book. You know today Southport's really known for its thriving art community and but as you might imagine that was not the case in 19, 1949 when um, when artist Art Newton left his promising career in New York City to bring his young family back to Southport. Uh, like many others, his goal was really to provide a safe, a safe environment uh, for his, his family and uh, to earn his living as a professional artist and photographer. And that's the story that Tommy's, Tommy Harrelson is going to tell us this morning uh, and tells it in his book, Southport's Art, Art Newton. Thank you, Bob. Are you ready for me? Yeah. Uh, just a moment here, Tommy. Okay, there's, Tommy's uh, on the screen there and uh, with us this morning. And he's a Tommy's a Southport native, and and his wife, he and his wife Julie, are members of the of the Southport Historical Society, and actually, I believe, friends to nearly every soul in in South Southport. Uh, Tommy helped helped me when I first first came town, actually before I was in town, because I was writing a little, a little book and connected me with a whole, a whole host of, of folks that made that, that book possible. Uh, and all it took was a, was, a, was a phone call to get that, to get that started with him. Uh, in Tommy's career, he's, he's a UNC grad, and he's worked as a management consultant and executive of major engineering firms. In the, in the 70s, he spent two terms in the North Carolina House of Representatives, and he also served as Secretary of North Carolina's Department of Transportation. Plus, he also worked at the uh, Dan Harrelson Grocery Store here in, in Southport, and uh, I believe he was the head of wine sales, was his primary, <laughs> primary position there. Uh, also with us today uh, is Julie Newton Geesland, uh, who is Art and Valley Newton's youngest youngest daughter, and uh, Julie will be joining the joining the conversation today. So with with that, Tommy, if you're you're ready, I'll move the slide forward. Uh, thank you, Bob, and thank you for the Southport Historical Society and for all you all do in uh, in Southport and for the arts and for the preservation of our history. Uh, I got this idea to uh, to write a book. Uh, when we first moved back to Southport in 2008, I had collected a small, have a small collection of arts works. It started with a picture of my dad's grocery store. He painted that picture and, uh, and daddy bought it for just a few, few dollars. And uh, it was on the waterfront. It's kind of an iconic Southport scene with the, with the uh, widow's bench and the uh, uh, Lewis Hardy shrimp dock too. And so it was a beautiful, a piece of history that was destroyed by Hurricane Hazel. But dad bought that painting and then I ended up with it. And then uh, Lou Hardy used it, that same, a copy of that painting for his book, uh, Classic Southport Cooking. Uh, it was such a nice painting that Preacher Baker, the Baptist preacher at the time, commissioned art to, to, for him to paint a, a copy of it. And so that was uh, the two of those paintings. Anyway, over time, uh, I collected one or two, I hung them in my store and people would come in and say, oh, you like Art Newton's work. And I've got one, would you like to buy it? And they would sell it to me informally. And one day at Valley called me, she by then was a widow and lived over on Atlantic Avenue. And she said, Tommy, I've got some things of art you might be interested in. So I went over and she had some detailed pencil sketches. And I bought four of those from her. She didn't know what to charge. She gave me a price and I doubled it because who knew what, you know, whatever the value they were was whatever he did. I didn't want to take advantage of her. So I paid her what more than twice what she asked. And so I had those and I kept, I had them framed and people could see them and little by little people kept 
bring in paintings in. So anyway, we kept those in Raleigh when I, we moved into to this house in Southport. I asked my wife's permission could I show just Art Newton works in the first in the front two rooms just to have sort of a little Art Newton gallery. So she allowed that, and then little by little they started talking to me, and I kept thinking, seeing them, and thinking about what else is there out there. I knew he had been very prolific as a right as a, as an artist. I knew about his uh, his photography because that's well that's his the best known about thing about art is photography actually because he did all the photography related to Hurricane Hazel. So if, you, if you see Hurricane Hazel pictures of this area, you will you will more likely be seeing something that Art Newton, his photography, because he was everywhere during that, during that storm, after that storm. But in any event, I started thinking about it. And I talked to my, my friends, uh, Lou Hardy and Brooks Pryke, Newton Pryke, and I got their advice. And uh, Lou told me about the legalities. You have to have the permission of the, of his heirs. So I got, got Julie Newton Gieselin and asked her, and she most graciously said that I could do it. And then I asked her further to write a letter to the editor of the state court pilot to start getting the pictures in. And God bless Ricky Evans and Debbie. At that time, during that time, that was, you know, that was a bad time he, everywhere. The economy had collapsed and people weren't doing much picture framing. So they, were, they had, didn't have any employees, but they were just hanging in there and they had time and effort. And they offered to take paintings in, in Take them un, un uh, take them apart, copy the paintings, and put them back together as they were for nothing. And but if they needed help, like most cases, they needed re rematting or maybe some cases reframing or repair, they would do that and charge for it. So they probably, I hope they broke even, but I doubt. It. I think they probably did their part too. But anyway, that was another act of generosity. Ricky and Debbie Evans couldn't have happened without them. So once the painting started flowing into that, that shop, I would go down and get copies of them. And then I'd go to, started talking to Art's old friends, Pat, Pitt, Pat and Paul Pittenger and to Hoyle Dozier locally and Mr. Sun Carey. And they gave me the background, the little historical sketches that are in the book about Art and about his work. So little by little, these paintings started coming in and then, uh, Julie let me see all of these stuff, all this stuff the family had kept. Uh, Sign-in sheets from art shows, one-man art shows that he had. Inventories of, of, of who had bought paintings. So I could, if people, if they didn't come in voluntarily, I could begin to track paintings down. And uh, it, was a, it was like being a detective. Where are these paintings? There are only a few that are in public places, like in the library and at the Southport Maritime Museum. And there's one, there was one at the Cape Fear Museum and uh, several at the First Citizens Bank on 4th and, and, uh, and Market Street in, in Wilmington. Uh, so those, that's how I came to get those. And they were, sometimes the people had to really be convinced. The bank didn't want me to, to take them out of, out of Wilmington. And so the bank manager, of course, that was during the time of of fear of, of not having work. Banks were, people, businesses were going under, and I guess the bank manager was scared. So I, but I happened to know somebody who knew the bank president, and he, he got, got me permission to use that one painting. It's a big, huge painting of downtown Wilmington in, in the year 1900. And then later I went back, and I thought, well, there must be more. And so I went back in their back offices and found more. So it, was, it ended up being a, a, a giant scavenger hunt, a giant detective story. And a lot of perseverance and being obnoxious and asking people to do things they didn't want to do. But anyway, all in all, we were able to get a, a lot of beautiful paintings. And through the generosity of the of the Evans of Ricky Evans Gallery, and the, the friendship of Paul Dozier, Mr. Sun Carrier, the Pittengers, Stuart Calary, and others who knew stories about art and about his work, we were able to put together a book. And I had a great publisher, uh, Daniel Norris of Carolina Beach. Uh, was the one who actually put the book together and did such a good job. So I'm, uh, with that, uh, let's look at the book a little bit. Julie, you want to add anything, dear? Are you on, Julie Gislin? I'm on. I just am so happy that you did this because it's such a treasure to my family 
just because I didn't know my father. I was only nine months old when he died. So I can't thank you enough for this, for me to hand down to the next generations to know the work that he did. Well, it was good of you to trust the, the, the story with me and I appreciate it very much. So I guess we should go on with the slideshow, Bob. There's a picture, there's a picture of art. art. Now that uh, uh, Oak Island now was composed of two, three little towns, two, three little areas. One was Long Beach and there was a, a pavilion uh, in Long Beach just right where you, where you would turn left after the, where the supermarket was and go down to the Strand. It was not too far after that. There was a long, oh, it was an old frame building in Long Beach pavilion. And that's where everybody went in the summertime. They had a jukebox and sometimes on the weekends they would have probably a country and Western band that plays some other music too. So that was where people went. That's Art and Valley kicking up their heels on a Saturday night probably. So go ahead. And this is a picture of the family, uh, Art, his, his grandparents, his sister, his mother and dad, his sisters over his sh shoulder and then his mother and dad. His dad was John Rowe Newton. His mother was Miss Fulcher. Uh, uh, Mrs. Newton was um, the daughter of the Fulchers. Go ahead. That's a picture of his high school graduation, uh, 1941, the year I was born. And so uh, that was a uh, really good find too. And Mr. Sun is in that too. So go ahead. And Art, when, uh, when Art was coming along, when he was a little boy, his, uh, his mother had mental, mental problems and had been institutionalized at Dix Hill, a mental health, mental hospital in Raleigh. And, uh, she died and Art was then, and his sister Ellen were living with their dad up, up near Moorhead city in the little area of Atlantic at a coast guard station. And so when they came home for uh, Mrs. F Mrs. Uh, Newton's funeral, uh, uh, um, they came back and then Ellen was left behind with, 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 the aunt, with the aunt and uncle, Miss Hetty Arthur, and Mr. Dave Arthur. And they, uh, on the way back, there was a car crash and somehow John Rowe Newton was killed in that car crash and Art was spared, uh, and didn't suffer any, any injuries that I heard of. And so he was left an orphan at, at such an early age and in, in a week within a week all of both of his parents were gone so miss hetty arthur and mr dave arthur took art and ellen in and they were reared in a house on lord street uh right in the third third block of, of lord street and they uh second block of north lord but they uh they had a little store on uh house street where ports call restaurant is now and he worked in that store and I guess Ellen did too, but he, with his, with his, with his mother went to school in Southport. And then later he went and after he left high school, he went into, to, uh, art school in uh, Ohio and, and, and he was able to work, earn his way, uh, at work in Wilmington to, to get up, gather enough money to go and then worked his way through art school in, in Ohio. And he served a, a bit of time in the Coast Guard during the war. And on the GI Bill, he went to fur, furthered his education at the School of Modern Art in New York City. Go ahead. That's a picture of the young couple. You see Art is standing on the step above Alec Valley. He, she was considerably taller than he. And uh, he uh, looked at him good because his, his step, his aunt and foster mother said he looked like Art, he looked just like Clark Gable. And he did have a Clark Gable look about him. He really did. His brother did too. There's a picture also of his studio in New York. And what's so interesting about it is we were able to find the painting on the easel and I own the drawing on the wall. So that was really a kind of a fun thing to see these artifacts that are in actually in photographs of the time. Go ahead. And that's a picture of the, of the young family, the, uh, the two boys, the first oldest child, John and Dana. Dana's deceased, John is still alive. And when he came back, he also opened a little shop in downtown Southport, uh, not to, just 
behind where the jewelry store is now. And this, they lived in a little apartment behind it. And, uh, and she, uh, he, and he had the shop in the front, sold photography supplies and art supplies. And he did his, his business there too. All right, go ahead. And those are pictures of where it's art and Valley and it, in different places on the beach and to the several houses that he lived in. The top middle is a house that they had built on Cape Fear Drive. It has actually a dark room in it. And, uh, they sold it eventually and moved into the Walker Pike house, his, one of the oldest houses in Southport where he lived until he died. And then there are pictures of them on the beach. He was always loved the water, loved to fish and, and loved to go to the beach. And of course that sup you supplemented your living by getting fish and shrimp and clams and oysters out of the water. You, you, you fed your family that way too. Go ahead. And that's a picture of the interior of the shop on the left uh, with uh, uh, where he sold all these things. And that's one of the local boys there. And uh, there's a picture of art at work in his studio in New York. Go ahead. And the picture on the left is one I referred to. That's what got me started. The picture of Dan Harrelson Gross with Lewis Hardy's shrimp boat in the back. And then he had this great love for shrimp boats. There were a lot of, uh, if he painted, he painted many, many shrimp boats and shrimp boat houses and was constantly, constantly doing that. So we, go ahead. And those are some typical Southport shots with, uh, that was the picture on the upper left is a picture of uh, what I think is Mr. Uh, uh, two, two local uh, people who went out, went clamming and, and Mr. George Wortham and Rab Hankins, I believe they are. Mr. George would be the grandfather of Bubba Smith, uh, a member of the uh, deceased member of the Southport Historical Society and a prominent citizen. And then down below, that's the picture of down on the uh, Brunswick Street where uh, Sandy Spencer lives now. That's uh, that's so, uh, and that you can see that that was a dirt street during that time. Most of the streets during that time, when art was coming along, when I was coming along, they recently there were sand and sand and shell streets, and it was only like in the late forties, early fifties they started paving. There's more streets to Southport. There was only one one paved street in Southport. It came down Howe Street, two lanes, and where the, the stoplight is, where the corner where the bank security or now it's first first national bank is, you take a left and go down to what was then the courthouse. And I believe the pavement ended there. There was just and it was just two lanes in the middle and dirt, sand and thing. But then uh then you see also pink his watercolors of the water. He, he loved the Southport waterfront, painted that a lot. Sailboats, Wrightsville Beach. So I'm going to go ahead and change. And more paintings of uh, of the, the beloved yacht basin, which is still, people still love to get painted, see that today. And uh, there's downtown Wilmington. That was one of the things that Mr. Sam Bissett collected. Uh, the picture on the lower right is uh, he took a, he took a, he, he went up in the, in a plane that was piloted by spot, spotter pilots. There used to be Menhaden factories here and they, to find the fish schools of fish that they uh, guided the boats to, they would go up in planes and find them. So he went up with whole, I imagine whole waters and took this picture and of the Southport waterfront. And in the foreground is the boat that came across the Atlantic. The, the Roland, it was, uh, as a, a story that Lou Hardy recounted in one of his books of Estonian re refugees who fled to Sweden and worked for two years to get the money to come to get to, to America. They always had this desire and somehow somebody knew about Cape Fear. So, so they sailed the coast of Europe to, to the island of Madeira and came across the Atlantic in some 30 days. It was some 30 people on that little boat. And they were, it was well provisioned and they came in to the, to the, uh, Brian Pan Shoals and one of the local, uh, by charter boat captains, we called them party boats, but charter boat captains, Captain Hewlett and Watts saw them and guided them into the river. They became a national cause because they were fleeing communism. And some people thought, well, were they communists themselves? But they weren't. And it was found out they were eventually 
repatriated and allowed to go. And one man actually married a local woman around uh, Holden Beach. So that's a, another story. If you want to read that full story, you should look it up in one of Lou Hardy's books of Home in the River. It's a great story. And Lou actually went to Estonia and found their old home place. So it's kind of a, he really did a great research. Go ahead, please. Next slide. Okay. Uh, Arts uh, was trained, his, his training was in commercial art. And uh, he did some of that in this area too, what was available. He went to, uh, he worked, uh, he, he created billboards. He worked in, uh, uh, for Acme, he, he did a lot of work for the Acme Fertilizer Company. There was a, up around uh, in Eastern Columbus County, off 74, there was Ac Acme and Delco, two little communities, and there was a fertilizer country, that company there. And he did their, looks like, to me like their, maybe their annual report, the, pa the paintings for that. And it's, and it's just, I mean, even that was beautiful, the, the way he did that. Uh, and there's some interior shots too, you'll see in my book that show uh, beautiful interior of a factory. You wouldn't have thought that he could make a factory beautiful, but he did. Go ahead. And he uh, and Valley, they had a, a they had a, a, a stint of printing. They 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 came up with this. He did all the photography of this area for Hurricane Hazel. So he put that in a book that was that I think probably was pretty well sold. And uh, and he uh, was able to get that out there. And it's another chronicle. And those some of those books are still around. That was owned by Leela Pickett. And I believe Julie and her family have one too. Go ahead. And there was one of the tragic things, Art and Valley had a sort of tragic life. Uh, they had a, a, a third child, Julie's the fourth. They, were, they had two boys and then Star, and Star developed leukemia. And there was no way that, she, there was no cure for that. And she had a, a early and tragic death, which profoundly affected the whole family. And especially Art, he had a nervous breakdown because of that and was, uh, in, in, in unable to even cope until uh, I found out later that when, when after the book had already come out, we had a show or two and some people down that have a house at Holden Beach to call and they told me and they had known, they had known Art and Valley and they had several paintings which are not in the book, but uh, they told me the story of when that her, the father thought so much of Art that he actually commissioned some work paid him to do some work so that he would get back into painting. He thought so much of his work and he did get back into painting. He did, did finally come out of this depression for that. And that's a picture next to that is a, of the little dock. And I think that's below the Walker Pike house. And maybe that's Valley sitting on the dock, but that's, that may be where he, he eventually left, well, left this world earth. Go ahead. There's art. He, a picture of him, the, the Clark Gable look, uh, he, uh, he had a tragic ending. He, uh, he had, he had uh, mental problems and, and alcoholism. And uh, eventually he, he fell, he, he, he drowned in the Cape Fear River right below the Walker Pike house. His family had gone to the, lived, was over at the beach. There'd been some sort of disagreement. They were uh, at least separated for the weekend. And he, 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 he fell in the river and drowned. And it's not known most all the obituaries and all of his close friends in Southport say that he, it was an accidental drowning, possibly alcohol involved. But then uh, Dr. Stanley South, who had done all the uh, a renowned archaeologist and uh, uh, who did the original digs at Brunswick Town, became friendly with Alan, with Art and Valley. And their families got together a lot, and he was, uh, and he became convinced that that Art. He had talked to Art, and Art was very depressed because he was unable to make ends meet. He was trying to, to, to provide for his family, and with the growing family, his art and his photography was not enough to provide what he thought they should have, and he just said, was in a... And so Dr. South thought, believed, that Art took his own life. Now, nobody knows, and uh, whether he did or he didn't, what time he left on this earth, he did, he created something that is unforgettable. And I'm so grateful because if you think about what Southport looked like in the, in the forties and fifties and sixties, there's no, you, without art's color,
paintings, you wouldn't have known what it looked like because there's very little color photography. Color photography that is all black and white, so you wouldn't have known, seen the colors and the beauty of the area that he captured because he loved it. He knew how he knew how to to, to put the uh, image on paper, had the bravery to do it, and the great talent. And also, he was a Cord Lou, a very talented art teacher, and he taught many local kids in, in the schools. So he had a lasting legacy in in his work and in and what the fact that Lou became an artist, Brooks Pryke became a, a very good writer and, and had her artistic uh, temperaments too, and others too. So we owe him a great deal for preservation of what Southport and Oak Island, Wilmington, Orton, Riceville Beach, to a certain extent, all look like in the, in the general area. And there's a lot of stuff in that book, and it's available at Southport Historical Society. And uh, now there, Julie has also allowed them to to uh, print do prints from that book. So if you can't get an Art Newton original, you can get a print. I guess that concludes my presentation. I'm willing for, to answer any questions. I can't hear you. Bob, you have to unmute yourself. Bob, you have to take yourself off mute. Can you unmute him? I can't, Zoom won't let me. Bob, you need to unmute yourself. You okay, know. I got it, sorry about that. Um, and what I, what I wanted, to, wanted to say, some of the, he did so many, many things, um, including Christmas, Christmas cards and greeting greeting cards, you know, and it had uh, pencil, uh, pencil and, and ink drawings of, of different landmarks in Southport. And one of the things I, I, <clears throat> I, I should have put in the presentation because I, I really uh, ad admire this. He would take pictures of his children. And do, do you know that, that story and have any detail on that? You or, or Julie? And then send them a, around the country and be picked up by, by uh, newspapers. I didn't know that. So I didn't know. Did you know? Really? He yes, he would stage lots of pictures with the kids. And then I guess there's a way with the newspaper. If it was in one, it would be picked up all over. And so mom had always kept the clippings of the newspapers. And that's, that was one of the things in that box that Tommy right. talks about that mom kept. Yeah. I have everything that's in that box. To, and that's why I, I put up on online on the, uh, Susie Carson Research Room, so, and that's that's how I became familiar familiar with them. And they're he's good at it. They're some very cute, cute, cute pictures of the of the kids. The other thing about art too, and those what what was so cool about Julie and or Valley keeping them, and then Julie and John let, allowing me to use them, was that he in his early life. The, the, the pencil drawings I got are detailed pencil drawings. I mean, with great detail. And I think it showed maybe, uh, maybe uh, he was not as confident as he was later in life because when you look at his later sketches, they're very, just, they're just simply sketches. And then he would do a painting from that sketch because he had the confidence to go ahead and paint from, from a very sketchy sketch. The original things that I've got are like, photographs almost amazing I wouldn't mind sharing a story my my brother Dana the one that's passed away I remember him telling a story about someone that came to visit dad and dad was telling him about a painting he had done of a ballerina and in the process of trying to tell him about it he just whipped out a piece of paper and painted it again for him and that just really inspired Dana that that talent and he could reproduce it so fast. I don't have that talent in painting, but <laughs> I'm glad that 
it was captured. <laughs> but Dana, Dana was very talented. I remember him well. He was, he could do a lot of things. He could paint. He could do woodwork. And the other, the other son is 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 uh, talented in woodworking and also a painter. Julie had, may may not be able to paint, but she's a good singer and a good performer. So Art also did that. He was he sang and he could he could sing all kinds of things, sang in the choirs and whatnot. So all very artistic family. Tommy, uh, the watercolors and some paintings themselves, as you mentioned, are depicting Southport history, like the, the, the one of the Roland, for example. But you, no, you notice in a couple of them that the, uh, the pilot's tower, the metal tower, is much, much higher, uh, at least twice as high, maybe not three, uh, maybe three times as high as the, uh, what's, what's left there at the foot of, foot of Howe, Howe Street. Um, was, was that the, uh, the, that shortness happened because of a, of a hurricane? Was there a collapse of any kind or was that, that I done? Think, I think, I'm, I'm trying to remember that you'd have to ask the pilots themselves. I can remember, I think they, they, they made it, they decided to shorten it for maintenance reasons. They didn't really use the tower anymore for spying, spotting ships. It was just, uh, they, they had it at one point to, to, for visibility, they could see ships way off. But once they went to, to mo more modern communications, radar, other ways of, of locating ships, they didn't really need that tower anymore. So I think that's the reason they just shortened it because of maintenance and danger. People would climb it too. And, you know, one kid fell out of it. Julie. I don't know how he survived, but he did. Julie, this is a question for you, if you know. I mean, I know that you were just a baby when your father died. Do you have any information about how your mom went on and took care of your kids and financially survived? that time? I know that her brother helped her out a lot. She had a brother who was a merchant marine and after dad died, I guess it was about three or four years, the lady that owned the house there on the, the Walker Pike house decided to sell it and my, my uncle helped my mother buy the house on the next corner and I know there was a little bit of social security that helped her along as long as us as I was a child. But then eventually she had to go back to work and, and she worked at restaurants. And the last year she worked at Dozier Hospital for um, 10 or 15 years there. Any other, any other questions? Well, let me, let me go to the, go to the next, next slide. Tommy talked about um, the generosity of, of Ricky Evans in helping Tommy prepare prepare the book, um, and that was in a, a a a bad business business period. Well, we're in another bad business period, and and Ricky Evans is though is still um, trying to be as helpful as he can. And what he's what he's done is uh, providing the, the historical society um, <clears throat> with the ability to offer uh, prints of Art Newton's water, watercolors. And you can see this uh, little collage of, of 10 of those, those watercolors. Uh, these, these prints are, are produced, would be produced by Ricky, Ricky Evans and then with, with proceeds going to the, to the historical society. Uh, and we would be selling them on our website, on the our store, our online store on the Southport Historical Society uh, web, website. And the, the cost would be $25 for an eight and a half by 11 print and $40 for an 11 by 14 print. Um, they really do show, and this is mentioned at one time by the state port, port pilot, they, they show the history of, of mid 20th century 
19th century Southport. And the, the things that, that Art Newton uh, loved, the, the ships, the marshes, the beach, the architecture of Southport. And uh, as the pilot noted, they all, all these prints speak to Art Newton's love of, of Southport. So uh, if you're looking to uh, perhaps add some, some prints of, kind of based on Southport history to your, to your collection, opening up your new, your new, your new business and you want some uh, uh, beautiful prints depict, again, depicting Southport history, come in to, uh, to our website and I, I think you'll be with, real pleased with the, with the results. The, the prints will be produced, I, I want to mention this because I want to just say the word uh, using uh, Z-Clay uh, uh, printing capability that, that Ricky Evans Gallery has. So I think you'll find them a, a real nice, nice product. So that's kind of the promotion and also, well, it's not the end of the promotion. I also want to mention that uh, because of the generosity of Tommy, Tommy Harrelson, the uh, book Southport's Art Newton is for sale uh, by the by the society, and you can also get that through our through our bookstore, our online bookstore. So, any 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 questions, either for Tommy or Julie or or myself? Well, if not, thanks everybody for for coming in. Thank you, Tommy Harrelson, and thank you, thank you, Julie, uh, for telling us about Art Southport's Art Art Newton. Really appreciate your help. Thank you, Bob, for putting it all together. Okay. You're welcome.